My name's Alex, and I guess you could say I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. But that spoon might as well have been a shovel, digging me deeper into a life I never asked for. My twin sister Emma and I, we grew up in a mansion with more rooms than reasons to laugh. Dad co-owned a tech company that was the talk of the town, and Mom, well, she ran the household like a tight ship. Her only job, making sure Emma and I lived up to the family name. From the get-go, it was clear Emma was the star. Straight A's, head of her debate team, and a whiz at chess. Me? I could barely keep up with the multiplication tables. But that didn't stop Dad from pitting us against each other like some twisted version of Survivor, where the loser got grounded from likes little comforts. Dad, why can't I just quit math club? I hate it. I'd moan, dragging my feet through our marble-floored hallway. Quitters don't quit, Alex. You think life's going to hand you everything on a silver platter? Dad would scoff, never looking up from his evening paper. But Emma's better at it. I want to try music. I'd protest, hoping for a sliver of support. Music? That's a hobby, Alex. It won't pay your bills or keep this roof over your head. He'd snap back, his voice echoing off the high ceilings, dismissing my dreams like crumbs from the dinner table. Emma, bless her, she tried to be the peacemaker, but even she couldn't bridge the gap widening between us. Alex, just play their game for now. We'll figure it out, she'd whisper, her eyes scanning the room for eavesdropping ears. But playing the game meant endless tutors, extra classes, and competitions where my only trophy was the title of the other twin. My parents had our lives mapped out. Princeton for college, then a cushy spot at Dad's company. A perfect plan for the perfect daughter. Only problem. I wasn't her. One evening, the whole charade came crashing down at the dinner table. Dad, why can't you be more like your sister? Look at her, making us proud. Mom chimed in, her voice sharp enough to cut through the tension. I slammed my fork down, my patience finally snapped. Maybe because I don't want to be her. I'm sick of math and science and all this crap. I want music, not this. The room went silent. Dad's face turned a shade I'd never seen before. He stood his chair scraping against the floor like a warning bell. You think you have a say in this? You'll do as you're told, or you can find yourself another family who will put up with this nonsense. He bowed, his voice booming. Tears stung my eyes, but I refused to let them fall. Emma looked at me, her face a mix of sympathy and fear, a silent plea to just back down. But I couldn't anymore. My house felt more like a battleground than a home, thanks to Dad's philosophy. Competition breeds success. He wasn't just talking about business. No, he made sure Emma, and I lived it. Every grade, every award was another round in the ring, and more often than not, I was on the losing end. One morning, I remember walking down to breakfast, the smell of pancakes filling the air. It should have been a good start to any day, but not in our house. Not when report cards had come in the day before. Look at this, Dad said, waving Emma's report card in the air like he'd won the lottery. Straight A's, Emma. You're setting the bar high. Emma, sitting prime and proper, just nodded, a small smile on her face. She was the good daughter, after all. And then we have Alex. Dad continued, his tone dropping as he tossed my report card on the table. A couple of B's and C's stared back at me, mocking me. I grabbed a piece of toast, not hungry but needing to do something with my hands. Yeah, so it's not like I failed, I said, my voice rising. Not failed, Alex? In this family, it's A's or nothing. You know the rules, Dad shot back his words like daggers. Emma tried to play peacemaker as always. 
Dad, maybe if we help each other out more instead of competing, we could both do better, she suggested. Dad scoffed. Helping? No, you need to push each other. Only the best for my daughters. I remember looking down at my plate, my appetite gone. So what, since I didn't get straight A's, I don't get lunch today. No lunch, no new clothes, you know the deal, Alex. Maybe next time you'll try harder, Dad said, his voice cold and final. The rest of breakfast was silent. Emma ate her pancakes, and Dad read his newspaper. And I just sat there, stewing in anger and frustration. It wasn't just about the clothes or the food. It was about being seen as less in my own father's eyes. After breakfast, I went up to my room, slamming the door behind me. Emma followed, knocking softly. Alex, you okay? She asked, her voice laced with concern. Do I look okay? I'm sick of this, sick of being compared, of never being good enough. I spat out my words, harsh but honest. Emma sat down beside me, her hand on my back. I know it sucks, but we're stuck in this together, right? Maybe we can find a way to make it work, to get through to Dad, she said. I laughed, but there was no humor in it. Yeah, right. Dad changing his mind. That'll be the day. Life at home was like walking on a tightrope, with every step calculated to avoid the next lecture or comparison. But whenever I could, I'd sneak away to my room, plug in my old beaten-up headphones, and lose myself in music. It was my secret garden, a place where grades and competitions didn't exist. One day, I mustered the courage to bring it up at dinner. The table was set, and the air was filled with the usual tension that accompanied our meals. Dad was going on about some business deal, and Emma was sharing her latest school project. It felt like now or never. Hey, I've been thinking. I started, my voice barely above a whisper. The room fell silent. I would want to learn music, like really learn it. Maybe take some singing lessons or piano. Dad's fork paused midair, and Mom's gaze snapped to me, her expression a mix of surprise and annoyance. Music, Dad finally said, his voice flat. We've been over this. Your focus should be on your studies, on getting into a good college. But I am focusing. Can't I have something for me, something that actually makes me happy? I pushed back, feeling a mix of fear and defiance. Happiness? You think life's about doing what makes you happy. Dad laughed, but there was no warmth in it. Real life is about making sacrifices, doing what's necessary. Music is a hobby, Alex, not a career. Emma glanced at me, her eyes filled with a silent apology. She knew how much this meant to me, but she also knew arguing with Dad was like talking to a brick wall. I don't see why I can't do both study and music, I argued, feeling the heat rise in my cheeks. Because I said so, Dad shot back, his voice rising. We're not spending money on some whim when you should be improving your grades. End of discussion. Mom nodded in agreement, her usual stance. Your sister is setting the example, Alex. Why can't you just follow her lead? The rest of dinner passed in silence. I barely touched my food, my appetite gone with my dreams. Later, Emma came to my room, knocking softly. Alex, don't let them get to you. You're talented, and you know it, she whispered, sitting on the edge of my bed. Talented, right. If I was, they'd actually listen to me. I mumbled, staring at the ceiling. It was the end of what felt like the longest year ever. School was a blur of exams, essays, and endless lectures about our future, specifically a future my parents had mapped out for us. For Emma, it seemed like smooth sailing. For me, a shipwreck in slow motion. I was in my room trying to drown out the world with some music when Emma burst in, her face flushed with excitement. 
Alex, the letters came. My heart sank. College acceptance letters, the ones that would apparently make or break our lives, according to Dad. Emma was waving hers in the air, a big fat envelope from Princeton. I got in, congrats. I mumbled, my voice drowned out by the jealousy and fear gnawing at me. Haven't checked mine yet. Emma's smile faltered. Come on, let's look together. It's got to be good news. We found my letter, a thinner envelope that felt like it weighed a ton. I opened it with shaking hands, scanning the words quickly before they blurred into nothingness. I, I didn't get in. I managed. Emma wrapped an arm around me, but I shrugged her off, feeling a mix of relief and despair. I didn't even want to go to Princeton, but explaining that to my parents would be like talking to a brick wall. Dinner that night was when everything exploded. Mom and Dad were already halfway through a bottle of wine, celebrating Emma's acceptance. Here's to Emma following in the family's footsteps, Dad toasted, beaming, and Alex. Mom asked, turning to me with a raised eyebrow. I took a deep breath. I didn't get in. The room went silent. Dad's face turned a shade of red I'd only seen a few times in my life. What do you mean you didn't get in? Did we not spend enough money on your tutors, your prep courses? How could you be so careless? I tried, okay. Maybe Princeton just wasn't the right place for me. I shot back, my voice rising. Not the right place. Do you hear yourself? You've embarrassed us, Alex, thrown away every opportunity. Dad yelled, slamming his fist on the table. Mom chimed in, her voice cold and sharp. We expected better. Your sister managed just fine. Why can't you? That's enough. I stood up, my chair scraping loudly against the floor. I never wanted Princeton. I never wanted any of this. I want music, not some business degree. Dad looked like he might explode. Music? Is that your excuse? Your disappointment? I felt something inside me snap. Fine, if I'm such a disappointment, maybe I shouldn't be here at all. Dad's eyes narrowed. Is that so? You think you can make it on your own? Fine, there's the door. Don't come back begging when the real world chews you up and spits you out. After the showdown at home, I didn't have much of a plan. Just a bag of clothes and a heart full of broken dreams. But there was one person who had always been my anchor in the stormiest seas, Grandma Jean. She lived states away, a fact that seemed more like a blessing now. It meant distance from the chaos of my current life. I scraped together what little money I had and bought a train ticket. The journey was a blur, each clickety-clack of the train tracks a step further away from my old life. When I finally made it to Grandma Jean's, I was a mix of relief and exhaustion. Her house, with its familiar cozy warmth, felt like a safe haven for the first time in forever. I spilled everything to Grandma the moment I walked through the door the fight, leaving home, my dreams of music. She listened, her brows furrowing and unfurrowing, her lips pressed into a thin line. Now and then, Alex, you've always been the brave one, she said, her voice soft but firm. Staying true to yourself in a world that wants to change you, that takes guts. But what do I do now, Grandma? I feel like I've just jumped off a cliff without knowing if there's water below. I confessed, feeling the weight of my choices. Grandma Jean chuckled, the sound warm and comforting. Well, you swim, darling. You swim hard. And about this music dream of yours. You said you applied to a music institute. I nodded, a flicker of hope igniting in my chest. Yeah, in secret. I even got an audition date set before. Well, before everything blew up. Grandma smiled, and it was like the sun breaking through clouds. Then that's what we'll do. We'll go to that audition, 
and you'll show them just how bright you can shine. The idea was terrifying and exhilarating all at once, but I barely knew the first thing about auditioning. What if I mess it up? Then you'll learn, and we'll try again. But something tells me you won't need to, she said, her confidence in me a stark contrast to the doubt swirling inside my head. The day of the audition came faster than I thought possible. Grandma Jean and I went to the institute together, her hand on my back a steady presence. Walking into that audition room felt like stepping onto a battlefield, my nerves soldiers ready to turn tail. But then I sang, my voice steadier than I felt, pouring every ounce of emotion I had into the notes. The room was silent for a heartbeat after I finished, a silence so complete I feared I'd failed, before one of the teachers finally spoke. Your voice. It's quite remarkable. Clear, emotive, and strong. You've got a raw talent that's hard to come by, one of them said. And just like that, the weight lifted. I had done it. I was in. As we walked out of the Institute, Grandma Jean's arm around my shoulders, I felt lighter than I had in years. You did it, Alex? I'm so proud of you, she said, her voice thick with emotion. The buzz of the first few weeks at the Music Institute was something else. Every day felt like I was walking on air, surrounded by music, by dreams like mine but unique in their melody. Grandma Jean was my rock, making sure I didn't float away into the clouds of my newfound world. One evening, as I was noodling around on the piano in the common room, trying to get a feel for a tune that had been stuck in my head, a couple of guys walked in. They looked about my age, carrying guitars and a sense of purpose. Hey, that's pretty good. You got a name? One of them, a tall guy with a mop of curly hair, asked. Alex, I replied, a bit taken aback by the Sutton Company. I'm Luke, and this is Mark. We're trying to put together a band, and we need someone who can handle the keys. You interested? Me in a band? The idea seemed as far-fetched as flying to the moon. I don't know. I've never really played with others before. Luke grinned. Perfect. Neither have we. It'll be a grand adventure. Grand Jean thought it was a fantastic idea. You need to mingle, make friends, and what better way than through the universal language of music? So I joined Luke and Mark, and we started jamming together, finding our sound in the clash and harmony of our instruments. It was raw, exhilarating, and utterly terrifying all at once. One day, after a particularly good session, Mark, ever the dreamer, said, we should record some of this stuff, put it out there, see what happens. Out there, I asked, skeptical. Do you think anyone would even listen? Luke's confidence was infectious. Why not? We've got something good going here. Let's share it. So we did. We recorded a couple of songs, rough around the edges but full of heart, and uploaded them online. I didn't expect much. Why would I? But then something crazy happened. People listened, not just a few, but thousands. Then tens of thousands. The comments poured in, everything from this is amazing to who's the girl on the keys? Her voice is incredible. I couldn't believe it. We had struck a chord and suddenly our little band wasn't so little anymore. Local gigs started coming in, each venue bigger than the last. The first time we played live, my hands were shaking so much I could barely hit the right notes. But as the music flowed through us, as I looked out at the sea of faces illuminated by the stage lights, something clicked. This was where I was meant to be. After one show, a guy in a suit approached us, a slick smile plastered on his face. You kids have got talent. Ever thought about going professional? We exchanged glances the unspoken question hanging in the air. Were we ready for this? Grandma Jean's advice was simple. 
Take the chance. Alex, you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Just remember who you are, and don't let the glitz blind you. So we took the plunge, signing a deal that seemed too good to be true. The gigs got bigger, the crowds louder, and our music spread like wildfire. I was living a dream I hadn't even dared to dream, my voice finding its way into the hearts of strangers. Then one evening, as I was sifting through our latest batch of comments and basking in the surreal glow of it all, my phone buzzed with a call from Emma. Emma, my twin, the other half of me. We'd grown so distant over the years, mired in rivalry and silence. Alex, hey, it's me, she said, her voice hesitant over the line. I paused, taken back. Emma? Well, hi. What's up? I saw you on YouTube with your band. You were amazing, Alex, she confessed, and I could hear the sincerity in her voice, a stark contrast to our last cold exchanges. A warmth spread through me. Really? You think so? Thanks, Em. That means a lot coming from you. There was a pause, and then Emma let out a sigh. I wish I had your courage, Alex. I'm here at Princeton, doing what's expected, living this life that feels like it belongs to someone else, surrounded by these kids who have everything, and yet I've never felt more out of place. Her words struck a chord, echoing my own feelings of being lost in a world where I didn't belong. Emma, it's never too late to change your path, to find what makes you happy. I know, but it's not that easy, Alex. Mom and Dad, they found out about your singing. They're furious, saying you're ruining the family's reputation. I laughed, but there was no joy in it. Let them talk. I'm done living for them. Em, this is my life, and I'm going to live it on my terms. As we ended the call, a mix of emotions swirled within me, pride for the path I'd chosen, sadness for the distance still between us, and determination to bridge that gap, to rebuild the connection with my sister, not as rivals, but as allies in seeking our own truths, our own happiness. Six months into the whirlwind that my life had become, with gigs almost every other night and our tracks blasting from speakers in corners of the world I hadn't even visited, I faced a confrontation I hadn't anticipated. Right after a show that felt like our best yet, the backstage drama outdid the onstage energy. Bursting into my dressing room, Dad's face was a storm cloud in human form. Alex, what do you think you're doing? You're dragging our name through the mud. Grandma Jean, who had been my steadfast supporter at every show, stepped in, her voice the calm in the tempest. Now, Richard, let's talk about this calmly. There's no need for a scene. The argument escalated quickly, voices rising until security had to step in. Watching my parents being escorted out was a scene I'd never imagined in my wildest dreams. Afterwards, Grandma Jean was firm with the venue managers. I don't want them anywhere near her, not when she's working. It's not just a request, I'm insisting. The next few weeks brought a barrage of texts from Mom and Dad, each one more cutting than the last, predicting doom and gloom for my career. They couldn't see the truth, blinded by their prejudice and disappointment. Fed up, I finally shot back with a link to one of our YouTube videos. Check the views, listen to the fans. This is real. The video had exploded, racking up millions of views and comments, praising everything from the music to my voice. The silence that followed was telling. They had seen it, the undeniable evidence of my success, and it had rendered them speechless. Two years zipped by like a fast-forward track. Then, out of the blue, Mom called. Her voice was different, hollow, like the fight had gone out of her. Alex, I need you to listen, just this once. She started, and something in her tone made me pause. She poured it all out, the bad luck that hit like a wrecking ball, Dad's business crumbled thanks to a backstabbing partner from overseas, leaving them penniless, 
forcing them to downsize their life to a cramped apartment. Emma too was hit by the fallout, pulling out of Princeton to chase a scholarship at a university she actually wanted to attend. And then came the kicker, the apology that sounded years too late. We were wrong, Alex. I pushed you too hard, loved too little. I'm sorry. Hearing that was like a punch to the gut, but not for the reasons you might think. I was over the anger, past the resentment. Mom, I... I can't do this. It's too much water under the bridge. But life had a way of moving on, and so did I. Emma called next, her news a bittersweet mix. She was moving, transferring to a university close by. Looks like it's going to be us three musketeers again, she said, her voice bright, trying to lift the mood. My music was my escape, my world where I could control the narrative. With grandma's encouragement and a stroke of luck, I landed a deal with a record label that believed in my vision. My first album dropped, a collection of tracks that felt like reading pages from my diary out loud. The charity concert in my hometown was a trip down memory lane, a reminder of where I started and how far I come. After the show, there they were, mom and dad. Time hadn't been kind. The years had carved deep lines of hardship across their faces. They wanted to talk, probably to bridge the chasm that had opened up between us, or maybe, as I suspected, because they were in need. I watched them for a moment, a flood of memories washing over me before turning away.